to share some thoughts on the terms blended learning, personalized learning, and customized learning. At Thai, we believe that when we start to mediate the learning experience with technology, we can create a blended learning experience. That blended experience allows us to untether teacher readiness to deliver content and skills from student readiness to receive them. We can use the best technology resources for some portions of learning and the best human resources for other parts of learning. Once we have the ability to create blended learning experiences, then we can move towards personalization. When we personalize learning, we create more opportunities to vary the path and the pace of learning for students. Now, blended learning and personalized learning are great things, but at Thai, we believe we really need to go beyond that and we also need to customize learning. When we talk about customized learning, we're really talking about varying some of the weight-bearing walls that support our current industrial-aged system of schooling. Once we can vary those weight-bearing walls, changing things such as grading schedules, course schedules, um, times of day that you take those courses, then we can really also vary the time and space constraints of learning. At Thai, we are here to help students and teachers move towards blended learning, personalized learning, and finally to customized learning. So some of these on here, um, grade levels, you know, right now I'm not sure they make sense anymore because when we put kids in grade levels, we're saying, well, when you're eight, you are smart enough to know how to do this, 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 and this. Whereas we know that not all kids learn the same speed, the same pace, the same way. So um, if we started blurring those grade lines a little bit and meeting kids where they're at, um, it, it kind of starts making more sense than just being so rigid that we're at this grade, so we're going to learn fractions. I don't care that you missed things before, we're going to learn fractions. So um, what we want to do is, is have you guys look at some of these weight-bearing walls. So yes, quickly memorize them. I'm, I'm going to make Mitch go back. Okay. So if we go on to the next question, go on one slide. So we want you guys to, to group up and talk to each other. So if you were to implement customized learning today, what would be the toughest weight-bearing um, wall to change there? And I'm going to make him go backwards just one slide so that you can see those weight-bearing walls again. And, and then where actually, which one do you think you could take on right away and have some success? So go ahead, and we're going to let you have four or five minutes to talk about it. So this is the interactive part, or one of the interactive parts of EdChat Interactive, and this is where you should click on the avatar of another person who's watching and discuss which of these weight-bearing walls you think would be really difficult. What you can also do is if you have your IM window open, and again, if you move your cursor over your avatar, you can open up the IM window. Uh, you can put your comments into the IM window and then that starts a text discussion with the other people here as well. So either click on somebody's avatar or start uh, typing in some ideas in the text window about which of these weight-bearing walls you think would be the toughest to implement. I'll bring myself down also. Uh, I think uh, Sherry and Lenny are going to be going and talking to you as well. And then we'll come back up in a few minutes. Okay, let me bring uh, Sherry and Lenny back up. Okay, so uh, you're, you're, you're back up. What are some of the things that you find that are that are especially difficult, or is everything especially difficult? Well, it's been really interesting because in different schools it's been very different. We have some schools that have moved, they're starting to move to a um, standards-based grade system. So mm -hmm. they're starting to make a different, you know, a move to something different than the ABC grades. But like one of my districts, they said, don't ever touch that, which I said ever was a long time, but we would put it off a little while. Uh -huh. um, so it, it really has depended on, on each of the schools. I think my mm -hmm. experience has been that um, in particular secondary, the high school and middle school schedules and courses, those are the big areas that are difficult. They're just used to having everything the same time every day. That's the tough one to crack. 
I think in the elementary, the biggest and the toughest one to crack is grade levels. Everything structures around grade levels. And so mm. those, those two areas in particular, the elements, elementary and secondary, even though both have to deal with those areas, I think it's a little more problematic with grade levels at elementary and courses and schedules at secondary. And, and I'd like to encourage those of you, you know, in the audience that if you have questions about difficulties that you see in your own school or your own class, that you put those questions into the IM or that you click on the ask button and ask the questions. Uh, did you find from anybody in, in the who was participating that they had specific areas that they thought were, were difficult or were there in, interesting discussions there? No, uh, we didn't. We didn't get into that too much in our discussion. We actually had some tech problems where we couldn't hear the other person. So. Oh no. Okay. So, uh, so then maybe the best thing for me to do would be to come down and bring your slides back up. Okay. Okay. One of the things. Oh, let's see. Is it, there it is. <clears throat> this one. No. Yeah. There we go. One of the things that we were working on with schools is that we started to realize they need some tools. Not only do they need the class through the classes that are online and some of the face-to-face -face planning uh, or face-to-face -face workshops and then the planning sessions, but for many of the schools, they needed more than that. What they needed were some guidance as to what does this customize look like. As you probably picked up from our conversation, our schools know out of the 10 schools we're working with, none of them are going about customizing the same way. Every school is a little bit different. And so what we were looking at is what are ways that we could help teachers, help um, administrators to get a better idea for this. So on the website, we've added some extra tools that help people get that next hurdle of what does it look like or what can, how can it be structured? One of the tools that we have here uh, is we actually went out and did interviews with teachers, administrators, students, and even occasionally parents. What does customized learning mean to you? And we had a whole series of uh, questions about that or um, that people then responded. When we recorded those interviews then, we put them up. Uh, right now, it's a page that's on our website that uh, is the label of the page is what does customized learning look like? And so the responses of these people were organized under questions. It's almost like an FAQ, but rather than us answering the question, you get to hear it from practitioners. So what we thought we'd do is give you one more example of a video that talks about that. And so if Mitch could bring up the Jeremiah video, this is a teacher who's asking the question answering the question about role of the teacher and how it's changed. The words coach come to mind, the facilitator role, and I think those really have always been there for me in my training. That's Those were the, the words used to describe our role, but I think motivator and encourager is now a more important word. I think because we're working one-on-one -on -one with students, we have to connect with them relationally. We have to see, see them and where they're at uh, emotionally, and a lot of times when you're teaching a, a a class of 30 and you're just giving a lecture, it doesn't really matter what their emotions are that particular moment. You're just giving your lecture. But when you're sitting there one-on-one -on -one with a kid, you need to know that person. Uh, you need to understand uh, what motivates them because you're working with them. And uh, so I would add to coach and facilitator, I would add motivator and encourager. And then the big one for me, and it's always been big, but I've always struggled with it, is assessor and feedback giver. Uh, somebody who yeah, I give a test, but I really, I want to know what you know, so I really want to assess where you're at. I don't want to know what your score is, I want to know what you know. And so finding ways, different ways to assess, given, given time and space don't really matter so much anymore, and you don't have to take the test on Tuesday at 9 o'clock because that's when the test is delivered. I want you to be ready for that exam or that thing, and I want to be able to give you feedback very quickly uh, so that you so that you know what you know, and, and then if you don't know what you know, or what you're supposed to know, we'll, we'll talk about that and we'll retest or we'll reassess. And so assessment for me has become, um, I mean, it's always been important. We talk about testing all the time, but assessment is, is 
I'm the new, you know, the new assessor. I, I feel like that is my role to figure out what you know and give you feedback as quickly as I can so you can go from there. What I like uh, uh, about Jeremiah's description was that we've talked a lot for years. Most of you have probably been involved in, in workshops and things for probably 20, maybe almost 30 years where you talked about not being the sage on the stage anymore. But then when you get to pass that and you say, okay, so what is it that teachers need to be? That's a harder question to answer. And, and right, what I really appreciated was, even though the things he described, all teachers feel they do that, it really becomes amplified when you're in a customized environment. Just as he described, you can't just be ignoring kids and where they're at emotionally. You can when you lecture, but you can't when you're working with them one-to-one -one or in small groups. And so we really look at there are some skills, mentoring skills that teachers need that go beyond what we normally have done in regular traditional classroom. Lenny and I have had the opportunity to get out and see a couple of schools that are, are working their way to personalize or customize learning. And that was one of our biggest takeaways of one of the schools we were in. We got to walk around the school with just students. They, they didn't send an adult with us so we could ask the kids anything we wanted. And the biggest message that we took away was the relationships they had with their teachers. And Lenny asked them, he goes, well, you know, you've been in traditional school. What's different about this school than when you were in traditional school? And they would say, well, you knew that this teacher over here was the grumpy one, and this one was the silly one, and this one, you know, was funny. And, and so they, they categorize these teachers. They go, but the teachers here care about us. And that broke my heart because I was thinking, those other teachers care about you too. But they didn't see it the same way. They have mentor teachers. They don't have the one teacher to 30 students thing where you, you don't get to know the kids when you're up in front talking at the kids. Now you're working in small groups and you're working one to one and you really sit next to the kids and get to know the kids and the kids really can feel how much the, the teachers care about them in a much different sense than what we ever projected in a traditional role. You know, it was fascinating that school of all the structural changes they did. I mean, for all practical purposes, it was a high school that had no schedule. There was no schedule whatsoever and the way they did everything was completely different. But in all those changes and innovations, the thing they hear back from parents and, and students is it's the relationship with the teachers. And so we really try to get that across to our schools that what we're talking about with customized learning isn't setting up some online things so the kids can go at their own pace. If that's all you do, you're not really changing much. Really what you're doing is setting aside your class time to do the more interpersonal kind of connections where you can work with kids individually and in a small group that's where the change really needs to happen. So that's where in our minds, that's why we love this video, like what you saw and all the other videos that we've got, where people get to hear the message from people who are actually doing the work, not just from us talking about it. Let's move on to the next slide and let's talk about the curriculum redesign. Um, Lenny kind of talked about that in the beginning, that we realized that there's a lot of curriculum work that has to be done if we're going to move to a customized um, environment. And there really are two chunks to this. For starters, we, and it doesn't matter what state you're in, whether you're using Common Core standards or you have your own state standards, one of the things we really believe is there's too many standards. Um, we find that in most states um, that we've talked to or worked with, that even if you gave so many hours, so many days, whatever, to a standard, there is literally not enough time to get through all the standards deeply like we should be doing and do a, do a justice to that. So the amount of standards has to be talked about, but also our standards right now, the way they're written, are very grade level oriented. They, they aren't a nice smooth progression of, you know, do you know this, let's move on, let's move on, let's get you better, and um, so those things need to be looked at. There's another side of it, though. If we're asking teachers to change how they, they deliver content, whether they put some things online or do a blended learning environment or they flip the classroom or they start doing project-based learning, all of which are great ideas, they need time to do that. And as of so far, I haven't found the magic wand for time. That is the biggest factor that stops a lot of schools. But we tried in the grant, and we're going to talk about the grant a little more, to build in some time for teachers to, to do this kind of work. 
So this summer we actually brought together a group of teachers from across the state and in July teachers voluntarily, um, we had about 80 of them come to a, a summer curriculum redesign event and they we did a little bit of presenting but most of the time was work time. They were networking with teachers from other schools because in South Dakota, if you're in a small school in a rural area, you may be the only middle school math teacher. So you really don't have anybody to collaborate with. So that was part of what we built in. And a matter of fact, when we started designing this, we actually brought in four teachers that are doing this kind of work and we said, okay, tell us what you would have liked in an event like this, you know, when you were getting started. And they said, we need time to talk to people in our district, which kind of took me back because I'm like, you're with them all the time. They go, we don't get to talk. We're busy doing the business of teaching. We don't get to talk. So they needed time to talk to, to um, each other. They needed time to talk with people of other content area or grade levels so they could have that collaboration time. And then they needed um, models um, to look at. And so when we were looking at that, we started talking about how we were going to do the models piece. And we said, well, if we bring in a group of presenters to present on different things they're doing in the classroom, would we do that all the first day of this three-day event? And I said, well, that would be boring. And then Lenny said, well, maybe we could spread it out and do some in the morning of each of the three days. And because I was being a naysayer that day, I said, well, if you teach me something on day three that I could have started using on day one, I'm not going to be happy about that either. So we decided we'd put our money where our mouth was we actually decided to flip this piece of it. Yeah, what we did is we asked educators from all over the nation. We had some people from Maine, we had some people from Pennsylvania, from Minnesota, um, South Dakota. We asked individuals if they would do a 10 minute flipped video on how they customize in their classroom. And for those of you that were asking, how do I personalize in my classroom tomorrow? This is the page you'll want to go to on our website. What you'll get are some tips and ideas from other schools as to how they go about personalizing and customizing in their classroom. And so if you go to the, the next slide, uh, Mitch, it shows uh, the top of this page. So when you get to the website, look for the link that talks about the models. Here, it's on the curriculum redesign page. We have about a dozen different uh, examples that people had. And so for this event, we put these models up so that teachers could look at this and this could be part of the conversation. They could talk about what did this person say or what, is that, what did that person say. But what's the beauty of this is that now we've got this on the website, it's useful for all educators. What was really impressive about this is that some of the that we asked, they didn't know us at all. But uh, we did uh, give them an honorarium in the end, but most of the people that contributed to this they would have done it for free because the, the whole idea of, the, of most of these people is if I can help other educators, I'll do it. And so if you take a look sometime, I would encourage you to uh, go through these different models. I think you'll find some very good tips about personalizing and what it can look like in a classroom. The one piece that you won't pick up from the website, which is kind of sad, is at the event, we actually had two days where we did panel discussions and we brought the that made these videos either in if they were South Dakota educators or we um, used a product called Zoom and we webinared them in and so our participants could um, hear them talk about you know a, expound a little bit more about what their video was about and we asked them some questions but then also the participants could ask them questions as well so um, even they didn't have a lot of questions but they really enjoyed listening to them and that was one of the pieces that most of the participants said was a really enjoyable piece to this three-day event. You know, when we look at this three-day event, like Sherry said, we have some of this content flipped. We had some presentations, but we kept them as short as possible. And then we gave them some work time and then some talk time. And I have to say the reception to that event was, we do a lot of events. We do professional development all the time. But this event, one of the questions on there was, um, how much would you recommend this to another educator? And on a scale of one to 10, and the average was nine. I, I mean, those are phenomenal numbers. This really hit a note with teachers. Having that time to have some conversations around curriculum and to actually have the time to start working on it with those conversations, 
really hit home for most of the educators there. And some of them formed some networks. Um, I know some of the middle school English teachers um, started a Google Doc that they shared amongst each other, and they're going to continue to put resources on there. Um, they, of course, shared emails and phone numbers and things like that. So none of our teachers are teaching, none of these teachers anyway, feel like they're teaching quite so much in isolation. And I think that's been one of the other problems in education for a while is that Teachers tend to go into their classroom and shut their door and do what they're doing, and they do it by themselves, and that means all the work is theirs. And for some teachers, it's hard to make the change, and for others, they really embrace it. They really are enjoying the fact that they can collaborate with other teachers. They're sharing lessons. They're sharing great ideas. They're, that part was just phenomenal. The, the teachers loved that they were able to have this network of people to work with. The other uh, thing I would just mention with this is that with this work, we did get the grant so that we could work with South Dakota schools, but we're wanting to expand this model. And whether it's the, by hiring Ty or whether you just want to emulate what we do, we just want to have more schools asking questions about how we teach and why do we do it the way we do it. Earlier, we talked about the, the definition of customized learning and that it can vary depending on what people say or personalized learning. The bottom line is this. We need to move away from the industrial model. That's the bottom line. And so if we can get resources out there to teachers and to schools and to administrators on how do we ac accomplish that, that's really the goal behind this. So you'll find in our website we have the classes online, and by the way, those online classes are open. We did not hide them behind a firewall, so anyone can get to the content of those classes. To utilize those classes and to get credit, we have schools join what's called time membership, and then those are available to the schools that way. But we did not hide the content. We wanted it open to everyone. You'll find the model, uh, the models that we just talked about are all there and available for people to look at. The interviews, we've still got more to get on the website, but you can go in and see some of those interviews right now. And so all of these pieces come together um, as a way of helping schools move forward. So I think what we'll do, let's Wait a minute, talk before, a bit. before you go to the last, yep. the last bit, I will tell you that when he's talking about doing some of this for college credit and doing it through um, time membership, the university that we're actually that we actually do our credit through has been so interested in this whole program that is we've designed here that we are currently working with them and this is being developed into a master's degree and we're hopeful that it will be online live this master's degree by 2017 so um, we're really excited about that. Um, the fact that they found so much quality in these classes and some of the things that we're doing that they felt it was worthy of a, a degree um, was thrilling for us. We're really excited about that. Um, uh, next slide, uh, Mitch. Does We did want to mention and, and say that because South Dakota, we've been doing this with the Bush Foundation, and that helps with the districts who are participating now. We currently have 10 schools. We're going to add six or possibly more uh, this coming year, maybe within the next few weeks. Uh, and we hope to even add more schools the third year after that. But the whole idea behind the Bush Grant was to help us get this kickstarted and going here. But we're also looking at talking with schools from other states, even possibly other nations, as to what can we do to help make this happen in your area as well. So the Bush Foundation has been a great start because it helps us use some of those funds for the developing time of putting these resources together. And, but we really want to take it the next step beyond. Let's move beyond just the schools that are involved in the grant itself. Well, and I would like to point out that when we talked about this the last time that Lenny and I got to be on EdTad Interactive, this was, and he mentioned it earlier, this was more conceptual at that point. We have now been out in these 10 schools since last November, October, November. And, um, you know, some schools are moving a little slower than others, but in some we've seen great changes. One of the schools that I'm working with, when we went and talked to them, the first meeting, they said, we just want to stay exactly where we're at for a year. You know, they've had some real pushback by other teachers and by some things, and they, they kind of were a little gun shy. And um, 
I really wasn't on board with him staying put and so I gently eased a little bit and talked to them and when I got an email in April that said oh Sherry you should know we're doubling the amount of students next year um, we decided you're right we can't stay status quo we're gonna go ahead that was so thrilling to me so we've got schools like that that are moving forward we've got schools that are further down the path they'd already started when we brought them on we've got some reservation schools that have a lot of socioeconomic problems, a lot of issues. Um, it's going to take a little bit longer to, to make progress there, but those might be the schools I'm most excited about because I think those schools probably need the most help and their students need something different because what they've been doing has not been working. So um, while we're still early in the grant, um, there we found such great successes so far that it just gets us even more excited that we feel like we're really on the right track to help schools move from where they were to someplace considerably better. I think uh, we've got one more group question here. Um, and so let's talk about this one for a moment. If you were to move forward with personalizing or customizing right now, what is it that you need? What is uh, your barrier? And what is it that would help you get past barriers to fully customize it? Yeah, and I'm hoping that people put that into the IM window so that you can see it and address it. Uh, okay. But I'm gonna I'm gonna turn the question back to you. If you look at the ten schools that you've worked with so far, uh, what would you say were the biggest barriers in those ten schools? Um, you know, one of the early schools that jumped in, uh, one of the high schools has been doing this for about three years, going on four now, and they, probably the biggest barrier was dealing with parent perceptions, and more, more accurately, misperceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that they ran into was uh, parents really were questioning it because they, they said, well, teachers don't teach anymore. And part of the problem was is that they were thinking that if the teacher's not in front delivering, they don't teach. And so it took some uh, work to actually start educating parents on the role of the teacher working with individuals in small groups is actually doing more teaching than standing in front delivery. Or uh, they also had misperceptions that, well, students only work when they feel like it. It wasn't that way at all, but that's those were the kinds of things that they fought there. I think in other schools, it's getting teachers past the hump of, what do you mean we have to get rid of uh, uh, grade levels? I That's what all my curriculum, everything is based around grade levels. How would we get rid of that? Those are the kinds of barriers that I think uh, for a lot of teachers, it, it makes it very difficult. So it, it sounds, you know, conceptually, it's people who are stuck in a, in a given paradigm and it's, it's breaking through and, and letting them free, free themselves from whatever constraints that, that they've really placed on themselves. Well, and for us, it's been less about, we've tried very hard not to go in and say, this is the way you need to do it. Because like Lenny said, all of our 10 schools are doing it differently. So one of my schools actually got mad at me because I wouldn't come in and say, this is what it's going to look like. And I said, I can't do that. It's going to look like what you want it to look like. I can kind of guide you a little bit, but it's going to look different here than it looks in another school. I, think I would think, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say some schools are pretty impatient too. I think when they have us come in and we do these processes, they expect us to walk in with a prescription. And then they just, the next day, it's in place. And what we're doing is actually more of processes of talking about the problems, the barriers, what is it that we need to change, what can change now, what do we need to look at maybe for another year before we change, those kinds of things. And that can be very frustrating to people who just want that instant prescription and let's just say we're, we're customized tomorrow. And one thing maybe we didn't mention is this really is for our grant schools a three-year process. They're in the grant for three years. They get support from us for three years. They get some monetary support to talk about things like an LMS and you know some things they need to do. So um, they have some money to pay teachers to do some of the curriculum work, that kind of thing. So um, we don't anticipate this to happen overnight. We don't mm -hmm. anticipate it to happen in a year. 
we am, we're not sure three years is enough to actually get them there, but we're hoping that we've supported them to get far enough there to where they continue moving forward. So if an elementary school outside of South Dakota, let's say an elementary school in Pennsylvania approached you and said, you know, we're really interested in doing this and we want you to coach us through, through the process. And we understand that it takes three years because anything worthwhile, uh, it, changing a, an, an entire school takes three years to fully implement. Um, what would it cost them? Well, uh, we don't deal with the money side of it, but um, what we look at is if you're really doing a full bank of professional development, and in essence, what we're talking about is two to four days of professional development, at least face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. uh, plus the online classes. And then plus the online classes and being a part of that, and then also bringing people in to work with a planning team two to four days a year that we were looking at, we were trying to keep the cost under $20,000 to make that happen. And so we can do that. And I know for some people, they say, well, that sounds like a lot. But really what you're talking about is this is the professional development program for the school. And it's the planning process, your strategic planning process for the school. We're really trying to keep the cost down to as much as we can so that it's possible for schools to do this. And that so, but I was one of us coming out. That does or doesn't include? Yes. That does. That does include. So I would say if it turns out, you know, you mentioned $20,000, and so even if it were, let's say, $25,000, and it turned out that the first year costs are 12, you know, 12, 12, 5, and then six to $7,000 each year for the other years, I mean, that's really not a lot of money. Oh, that was 20000 a year. Oh, 20000 a year. Ah, Sorry. Okay. Well, that's still not a lot of, you know, that still is within a lot of principal's authority. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what so, we tried to do. Yeah. So no, I don't. I don't think that that's. Uh, you know, the, people waste a lot more than that. Well, and even though he threw that number out there, when we sit down and have the discussion with any school, we design the program specifically for that school. So they might say, "Oh, we need you more than four days in front of our teachers. We want you six. So it's kind of a we build your own package kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it, it's not just, I don't want anybody to walk out of here and go, well, $20,000, that's, that's the cost. If you only wanted the professional development or you only wanted the strategic planning, it could be less. It depends on what you want. But that's the 20000 is kind of what we felt for a, a real solid package. That's what where we estimated. it. Okay. No, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's a lot, um, you know, for a principal uh, to – you know, they, that's very doable for a principal to make a decision on. Yep. And we, the way we looked at it was that by trying to keep the cost down, even if a school can't afford even, let's say, 15000 or 12000 we tried to make as much of this available that if they've got people in their district that do this kind of thing, that they could emulate some of it themselves. So mm -hmm. we're, it's not really an issue of us trying to – Go out and make a bunch of money on this. It's it's really more about just helping schools get there one way or another. And I, and I love how Lenny says it that way. But the reality is, sure, you could em, you could emulate what we've done, or you could hire us. And why would you not hire us? So there's that factor too. No, you're driven. You know, you obviously you you you're passionate about the kids and uh, you know maximizing the kids time in school and making it more actually it probably makes it a lot more fun for the teachers because they're no longer just droning on they're really getting to interact and watch the, the fires lit under their students it's been really interesting because we actually we get to know our teachers really well because we're out in the schools and one of my teachers is a veteran teacher she's been teaching high school English for I don't know 17 18 years and she said to me I am doing more work now than I have ever done in my life, and I would never go back. I'm making a difference, and before I didn't know if I was making this kind yep. of an impact. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the kind of testimony we just can't pay for. Yeah, right. That's great. The other, the other thing I do want to make sure that everybody understands is every decision, everything that we talk about, the one question we always ask is, how does this impact the student? every single thing we do and it's amazing how much a school isn't about the student schedule right. we have we have hard evidence that show middle school students 
start if they were to be able to start at 10 o'clock they would do much better there is brain research that shows that but we don't right. change our schools because it's not convenient for the adults the bus has to be considered the lunch has to be considered we do things for the adults the same thing goes for the classes we teach do you know why we teach biology and then chemistry and then physics I do actually so there because I've been here before we teach well, I knew that way. We teach them that way because they're in alphabetical order. There is no no brain research that says you need to teach them in that order. We do silly things because it's convenient for us, and we have really adopted the model of stop doing that. We're going to do and, and do you know really who about the kids? Do you know who put them in that order? I do not. Andrew Carnegie. I should have known that. I should have known that. Okay. <laughs> School, right? Yes. Uh, uh, it's, it's probably, it's got to be more than 100 years ago. Yes. Uh, yes. We've been working with this model of education since 1892. Wow. It's probably time to change. It's probably time to change. So let's change now. So I'm hoping that everybody who's attended has gotten uh, um, a taste of what customized personalized learning can really be and I know that people are going to be watching the video also because we've been recording this and uh, do you have any closing statements that you'd like to make you know I, when we talked about the, the putting all these materials together it really takes an enormous amount of time and matter of fact one of the people that's in the, the group here is one of the people who's been instrumental in helping us develop this and if you are going to emulate this, you really do have to throw time at it. It's not something that happens very quickly. But I think that when you look at schools who take this on and they understand that it doesn't happen overnight and they really start to catch the vision, once they start going down that road, it really gets exciting. And I think mm -hmm. the bottom line is when you look at where the kids uh, have a much uh, a personal interaction with their schooling. What we hear from a lot of the schools is that it isn't necessarily that you're going to raise test scores doing this, but we hear from just about everybody, behavioral issues drop dramatically because so much of it is institutionally imposed on the kids. Mm -hmm. And we really are starting to see changes in uh, even in the schools about the whole way they handle behaviors and everything. Matter of fact, one of the schools said he hired a new assistant principal and he told them if you want to learn about how dealing with discipline you're going to have to go to another school hmm. and, and I'm just going to add in here I you know I've been in education for a long time and every year it felt like that at the beginning of the year they brought in somebody like us who hmm. did professional development and every year there was somebody that came in and said this is the silver bullet that's going to fix education and I have rolled my eyes so far back in my head that I've actually seen my brain. I kind of, I kind of worry a little bit when I'm here saying this is a silver bullet that's going to fix education. But in in all the years that I've been doing education, I've never come close to the excitement I feel about totally revamping the education system and really putting it about the kids and meeting the kids where they're at and moving them forward. Yeah, and I wouldn't call this, you know, a silver bullet to me is a magical, you know, potion. It does, you know, it doesn't necessarily, it's it's magical thinking. But this is really just going back and it's a process to reevaluate what we're doing based on what we want to accomplish. And the, and the peep, and it involves all the people who are trying to accomplish it. And um, and that's not a, 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 a magical thing. That's really the basis of any type of change that works. Well, and it takes a lot of hard work. And we tell our teachers straight up when they join us, this isn't easy. And just because you flip your classroom or put it online doesn't mean now you get to sit at your desk and drink coffee. You're in there with those kids, sitting with them, working out with them one-on-one, -on -one, and you're working hard. And it, it's not easy, but it's worth it. Good. Okay. Well, um, you know, I, uh, I I wish you luck in the in the fall with your with your new schools. Um, I know, uh, Lenny, you're just going to be sitting back and watching Sherry do all the work, right? Yeah. Well, some actually, I have to carry the load. That's how it really works. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Okay. Ahead, more more later, right? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll 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 hope to talk to you all soon. All right. We, okay. we appreciate right. it. Thank, thank you. you so much. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye. Okay. And this is Mitch Weisberg, and I'll be signing off for EdShed Interactive. I hope to see you in all in September uh, for Monty's session. And uh, good night.